Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Pack Hub's latest packaging webinar, Recyclable Packaging Innovations. Delighted that you can be with us today. My name is Paul Jenkins. I'm Managing Director of UK Packaging Innovation Consultancy, the Pack Hub. As always, I'm joined by my colleague, Farron Pamplin, Technical Director, also at the Pack Hub, who will be chairing the Q&A sessions at the end, towards the end of the session. And we also have Vincent Moy, who's director um, at Suez Cert Pack, uh, a very experienced sustainability and recycling expert, and a real um, privilege and honor to have uh, Vincent giving his words of wisdom later today. So he will be helping us to understand the recycling of household packaging during his presentation. So what we will cover over the next 55 minutes or so, um, 60 seconds on the pack up and the innovation zone, uh, we'll split the innovations, the recycling innovations into two sections, uh, which uh, the middle part of those innovations will be split with a uh, presentation from Vincent, get a grip on recycling. Um, and then we'll have details of our next event. Um, you'll see a Q&A section at the bottom of the, uh, the display. Uh, an opportunity for you to ask any questions. We'll be, uh, positively encourage you to get your questions in. Um, you will get a link to this webinar recording post-event. Um, and also this webinar and all our other ones are available uh, on our YouTube um, account, um, youtube.com forward slash to pack up, as well as all our other video content is available online there. So who are the Pack Hub? So those of you that have, uh, have not joined us before, we are a, a leading packaging innovation consultancy focusing on four areas of services, um, uh, packaging consultancy um, and technical support uh, and project management led by uh, Barry and his team. Uh, we do events and webinars. Um, we publish uh, packaging reports. Our most recent has been the Global Packaging Trends Compendium, uh, which we launched recently. And last but not least is our Innovation Zone Packaging Database. Now, this is a global uh, innovation resource, searchable and very easy to use. Uh, over 4,800 packaging initiatives. We upload uh, 20 new innovations every week. And these are um, not just in market, launches uh, on supermarket shelves but they're also sort of concepts from from, from designers and universities and the like that are uh, where, where the innovations may be two or three years away from from coming to market uh, very much global view so we have uh, google alerts and various systems in place to track packaging in about 15 different languages and um, so the whole resource is a is an excellent way to, to keep you and your team up to speed as well as get some inspiration and some new ideas. These are a selection of the um, members to our, to our database, and we've recently been joined by AG Bar and Twining, so welcome to them. Um, we recently launched, as I mentioned, a global packaging trends uh, compendium. Um, and what I'm going to do just before we go into the, the meat and the bones of the recycling section is just briefly go through um, the, the the nine packaging trends. I think it's important to, to get a bit of context. So the first trend is uh, naturally done. So um, this is all about compostable, biodegradable, and uh, bio-based examples, um, both in development and coming to market. So we're seeing uh, a lot of sort of um, plant-based initiatives, um, with, with plastic being uh, currently um, seen as um, a, a, a not ideal material by many, but not all. Um, so lots of challenges around compostability and you know, curbside collection and, and, and all those kind of things. But uh, it's um, uh, we, we are essentially reflecting what's going on in the market. So lots of examples there. Everyday engagement, so that's about packaging that uh, interacts and engages with end users. Um, the ability to operate uh, an ongoing dialogue with consumers is, is increasingly important and obviously we've got technology now that makes that a little bit easier. Um, smart and intelligent solutions such as RFID, NFC and QR codes are increasingly being used for these purposes. So we're, we're tracking lots of innovations in that area. Um, the growth of the uh, e-commerce mar market has been significant, as we all know, in the last 14 months or so. COVID-19 has given the the sector a real a real boost um, as we've seen swathes of consumers worldwide really compelled to, to switch from from their local 
uh, bricks and mortar stores to buy directly uh, from their mobile or computer or even tablet screens. Um, some of that behavior will go back to switch to, to green store um, post pandemic, whenever that happens. But clearly, um, there is was always a, a, a large growth anyway, double digit KGARs. Um, so the online market continues to offer up lots of packaging innovations. Making life easy. So this is all about added functionality, packaging that's easy to use and makes life easier. The consumers continues to be popular. So we're, we're tracking um, a number of different initiatives in that area. Materially change. So this is from this is about moving from one material into another, um, primarily about really switching out of plastic into other often paper-based alternatives, but not always, but that, that has been a, a big change over, uh, over the last 18 months or so. Um, so that is something that we're, we're tracking a lot of different innovations on. Uh, protect and preserve. So this is all around the prevention of food waste uh, so, uh, and other waste um, solutions. So uh, it's widely reported um, that up to 50% of all food produced globally is never eaten. Uh, which is tragic and the value of this waste food is valued at over one trillion so clearly more needs to be done and um, packaging can play its part uh, and obviously technology is, is is contributing um with recent developments that use sort of know-how to detect and communicate changes in the state of food for example but there are other examples coming to our attention uh getting noticed so that's about uh, standing standing out on on supermarket shelves so you know uh, in an ever busy and competitive marketplace is really increasingly important for brands to, to stand out and be noticed. So we, we continue to track innovations in that area. Refill revolutions, so that's all about the, the significant increase in reusable and refillable packaging examples uh, that have increased in currents, notably over the last 18 months or so, uh, emitted from a smaller base, but um, we're, we're seeing lots of Lots of examples come into market, mainly in things like dry food, household and personal care, but other sectors are also joining the party. And why are we here today? Well, it's about recycling. So this is our, our ninth uh, packaging trend from our Global Packaging Trends Compendium. Um, and recycling has been a very, very active area uh, in the types of innovations that we're tracking in our database. Um, this is about, um, you've got various plastic packs worldwide that are influencing um, the amount of recycled uh, recycling being undertaken. Uh, lots of examples of modern material developments um, coming to our attention. We've got the introduction of plastic taxes uh, on the horizon, which is influencing the recycling packaging. Uh, the UK, for example, is due for uh, their uh, implementation in April next year which will see a levy on plastic packaging with less than 30% recycled content. Uh, this, in this activity inevitably influences demand for, for packaging reduction activities. Um, so lots of, lots of activities uh, going on there. So let's look at some innovations. Um, as always, uh, just uh, important to sort of acknowledge that um, we're, we're, we're reflecting what's going on in the market. We feel it's important to show you what is is happening in in the marketplace so these aren't uh, necessarily uh, endorsement or or, or or indeed examples of best practice but what we're saying is these are the kind of things that you need to know about uh, in the marketplace for, from a recyclability point of view so first up is um from smurf at kappa who are obviously a leading corrugated packaging company one of the biggest in the world and they've been on the innovation trail with the announcement of a new composite paper tube uh, introduction. Uh, Smurf at Kappa Composites division has introduced the EcoTube made using only FSC source papers and uh, recycled board. It is recycled through consumer recycling schemes. EcoTube is being touted as a cost effective alternative to plastics. The tube can be combined with a range of print options and finishes to emphasize uh, luxury and premium. Um, the composite paper tube has applications across traditional paper premium markets for things like alcoholic spirits, beauty, and cosmetics. Um, the business recognized the need to make the tubes more easily recyclable for the consumer to create a 100% recyclable tube uh, without compromising all the original features and functionality. Next up is the UK-based cellular materials manufacturer. Um, and they've launched a, a multi-layer mono material as a replacement for existing multi-layer 
liquid cartons. Most cartons cannot be effectively recycled as they are often, as you know, a mix of materials like cartonboard, aluminium and plastic. Uh, so this new material from uh, Zopor Bones called uh, Resource is manufactured using 100% recyclable HDPE. It can also contain up to 100% recycled HDPE as well. Uh, so it's on trials. Um, and the printed cartons were successfully identified as recyclable. The multi-layer structure is formed into sheets, and this is said to fold in a similar way to cardboard material suitable for use on existing packing machinery, and is indeed compatible with all current caps and closures. Surface printing is possible for branding and product information. So that solution is currently being launched uh, with a partner in, in, in South America, followed by uh, a launch into Europe. A bio-based coating for paper has been developed in Germany by the Fraunhofer Institute for Process Engineering and Packaging. The coating is made from plant-based proteins and waxes, thereby eliminating the need for plastic. It is claimed that it is, can be recycled in normal, normal uh, paper streams. Uh, the proteins deliver a, a barrier to oxygen while the wax is served to give a water barrier. Uh, the food spoilage is reduced and an extended product shelf life can be achieved. Thanks to the oxygen barrier, chilled products such as meat and fish can be packaged in the material um, and it's also suitable for frozen applications. The challenge for the team was achieving the correct ratios of bio-based proteins and food grade waxes, which were then applied to, to the paper as an aqueous solution and coated using roller technology. The paper is alternative to plastic medicine bottles, uh, an Israeli-based collective set up in 2014 with a view to improving the lives of disadvantaged and disabled people globally has created a, an, an alternative to plastic medicine bottles. Tikkun Olam makers, also known as TOM, have designed a board-based alternative that fulfills FDA guidelines for water and light barriers and also as important child resistance. The child-proof design works through the lid that has tabs that clip into the main body of the container which can then only be opened by squeezing the pack in predefined areas. Once the packs are empty, they can be disposed of alongside the biodegradable label in conventional composting and is also recyclable. It is not clear how this can be done at home or industrially. Um, and obviously if it has a, um, a water barrier, then presumably has some sort of coating, but there's no information about how that, uh, that barrier is achieved from a water perspective. Japanese beauty brand Care, they've been very active in our innovation zone in recent times, and they're collaborating with Frankfurt, Germany-based non-profit startup Trash to Treasure with the aim of making recycled packaging. The Frankfurt startup specializes in turning packaging waste into sustainably designed products. The pilot project starts with packaging for Keo's hair care brand Ghoul, uh, where recycled materials will be turned into reusable keep boxes for the shampoo. Um, kind of, we mentioned the innovations, the trends at the beginning, and this is a good example of, um, you know, they're, they're not um, in terms of a Venn diagram, they're not mutually exclusive. So um, you know, this is also a reusable initiative as well as one that uh, incorporates uh, recycling. Uh, the boxes will be available as an on-pack giveaway uh, with, with the solid shampoos in drugstores, um, and the collaboration is a, a, a seen as a sustainable step forward for KO in line with the company's 4R program, which is about reusable, recyclable, replaceable, and reduce. The latest step in Sainsbury's uh, remove, reduce, recycle, and reuse plastic pledge is moving forward. The UK supermarket chain has um, pledged to halve its plastic packaging from the 2019 base by 2025. So uh, a new initiative sees the retailer recycling uh, rescued plastic from coastlines for its fresh fish packaging. Uh, the move is in conjunction with prevented ocean plastic and could save nearly 12 million plastic bottles from entering the ocean each year. Sainsbury's fresh fish range will contain 34% of the recycled plastic in its packaging. So it meets the uh, plastic packed, um, plastic tax um, pledge coming in uh, next year, which is about 30% recycled content. The packs have been created by Sharpak UK and Richmond upon Thames based Bantam Materials, who are the supplier of the prevented ocean plastic. Sainsbury's strawberry punnets will also 
uh, have 80% recycled ocean bound content. The scheme will contribute to the creation of uh, over six and a half thousand days of employment for um, collectors of the plastic bottles. German based chocolate confectionery producer Ritter has collaborated with uh, the Kula Group uh, to replace uh, their current Ritter Mini mix bags with a single ply paper based alternative. Ritter have carried out extensive trials using uh, Kula's uh, Next Plus film. The material grade used was Next Plus Steel Pure 65 gram paper and is a barrier coated solution um, that feels natural and has excellent strength characteristics. It also has good odor, grease, water vapor and gas barrier properties. Initial tests were carried out without product um, on uh, vertical form fill and seal packing machines and the most critical aspect being able to achieve a satisfactory seal without having to invest in new Equipment. The film is said to give a considerable reduction in greenhouse gases compared to both PE, coated paper and conventional laminated plastic films, although no data has been provided to help support this. The new packs are available internationally and most recently been launched in Germany. And this is really part of um, a, a bit of a change really in the confectionery market, which has seen um, a, a handful of solutions switching to paper based uh, initiatives. And last up, before we hear from Vincent, um, meal kits, which uh, have grown significantly um, over the last sort of, well, they've been growing nicely for four or five years now, but have had a bit of a boost with the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, you know, delivering recipes to customers together with fresh ingredients um, have do have a, an environmental impact to consider. Hello Fresh is in the US, I think they're the biggest um, meal kit brand in the world and they've moved to 100% PCR, post-consumer recycled corrugated packaging for its pre-portioned uh, ingredient boxes. The packaging was created with um, the help of Pratt Industries, um, and it is reported that the more sustainable solution will save the equivalent of 115,000 trees, nearly 218 million litres of water, as well as reducing CO2 emissions by nearly 7,000 tonnes per annum. Um, the new boxes will be used for shipping meal kits uh, across the Georgia and Texas operations. So um, the, these meal kit brands are recognizing that, um, that they have a lot of packaging um, and they need to improve their recyclability. So uh, it's good to see this initiative coming to market. Right, now we have, we'll be hearing from um, Vincent Moy, as I mentioned at the beginning, a very experienced sustainability and recycling expert uh, from Suez Surf Pack, who will be helping us to understand the recycling of household packaging. With his presentation, get a grip on recycling. Over to you, Vincent. So thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, tell you a bit more about uh, recycling. Get a grip on recycling. So really understanding uh, recycling of household packaging. That's uh, what I'll be talking about in the next 20 minutes, but I'll start with a, a short introduction of Suez and Circpac. Suez, one of the uh, largest world uh, companies worldwide in, in sorting and recycling of uh, waste. Uh, so we have uh, on, on packaging waste, we, we do a lot of collection services uh, worldwide. Um, we have our own sorting facilities in multiple countries, and we do a lot of reprocessing of different materials. Um, so we have a lot of on-hand experience. At the same time, uh, everything I will explain to you today is more generic than that. It's not Suez specific, it's really for the entire industry. Uh, with Suez Circ Pack, we provide a lot of uh, uh, expertise to brand owners, packaging companies and retailers uh, who are looking to get their packaging uh, better recyclable and uh, for this we uh, provide online master classes on recycling uh, we give dedicated packaging advice uh, we can certify the recyclability of uh, uh, packaging and we have huge insights in in all the differences there are between the countries uh, at the moment we have uh, analyzed 68 countries worldwide we've also gathered a lot of big data on packaging and how this data, uh, how this packaging is actually being uh, sorted. So we can always look back in our data to find uh, uh, exactly how your packaging is doing. So these are the services. And now we start with the main question, what is recyclable? 
what it all starts with are four criteria that need to be met before we consider uh, a packaging to be recyclable. So your material needs to be collected. So it should be allowed in a collection system uh, in the country that you're uh, marketing. Um, once it's collected, we should be able to sort it uh, by material. And after that, this should mater these materials should be sent to a reprocessor who should be able to reprocess it without there being any uh, obstructing substances in there. And finally, of course, we need an application to ensure that uh, the material actually is used. And if all these four criteria have been met, then we consider it recyclable. So everything starts with collection. And when you look at collection, um, one of the first things you should ask yourselves is, where does my product actually become waste? Yeah, where is it used? Which country? But also, where in this country? Is it a B2C product? So will it be in the household? Uh, will it be B2B? Um, and then how is it collected? Is this typically something that you use at home or out of home? So really depending on the product, but of course also in the infrastructure for collection. Is there curbside collection? Are there municipal drop-off depots? Um, is it part of a deposit system? Or maybe if nothing is available, you have your created your own take-back system or something in the in the uh, in store in supermarkets. Um, so this is very different per country and per type of material. Uh, um, what is organized. So always good to check the local situation for your uh, packaging. Now, one of the things that uh, is mentioned a lot is that, is there money to be made in waste? Yes, of course there is, but it's not the intrinsic or economical value of the material that creates this, uh, uh, this, this money. Um, overall, we see that the collection, sorting, and reprocessing of, uh, of packaging waste actually costs money. So there's a value chain deficit or a value chain gap. And this is typically covered by extended producer responsibility systems uh, to make up for this loss. Um, and just to give you a little bit idea on the cost just for collection. So for this collection, we need a truck. We need, uh, uh, this truck needs to drive, so it needs diesel and a driver. It needs to be planned. The administration needs to be uh, okay. We need a depot where the material can go to. And then of course, we need transfer to a final destination. Now looking at collected materials, let's say we have a curbside collection of uh, mixed uh, packaging, household packaging. You still have a mix of material, different types of plastic combined with, with all kinds of other materials, uh, uh, beverage uh, cartons, uh, uh, steel, um, aluminium, uh, in some countries also glass. It will have labels on it, stickers, uh, uh, sleeves, um, there will be glue. And of course, there's other material attached to it as well. So it's a huge mix of materials, contaminated, um, and only a small, uh, relative small uh, volume, small, uh, low weight. So looking at all the cost and the final result, you can imagine that this is actually costing money. So that's just the sorting. Now, uh, sorry, so the, the collection. Now let's go to the sorting. Um, and then you can go to, a, to a, a MRF, as they call it in the UK, sorting facility, um, where all the combined packaging materials are sorted by the main type of material. This is just an example of uh, a plant in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, it can depend on, of course, on what is actually allowed in the system. We see uh, that in the UK, uh, most of the time glass is accepted uh, in the flow as well, where in other countries, this is, has a separate collection system. In some countries, we see that cardboard is allowed. Also, yet there you see differences and specific uh, uh, plastics can be sorted or not, polystyrene, for instance, in, in, in Germany. Overall, material coming in, entering a bunker, and then it will go first past a, 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 a bag opener. Going up, entering another bag opener, because we want to ensure that each individual packaging uh, is separated uh, and so we can identify it individually uh, on the conveyor belt. Material enters a sieve drum, 
where we basically get rid of the very small materials, everything smaller than five centimeters, uh, uh, we will probably lose. Um, everything smaller than two centimeters for sure, also components smaller than two centimeters we will lose. Uh, everything between two and five centimeters depends on the, on the region, on the country, uh, and sometimes even on the weather conditions. Um, but uh, uh, everything between five centimeters and typically the size of an A4, uh, so 30, 33, 35 centimeters will be okay. Then we have wind sifters. Here you see number six. Uh, they basically uh, uh, sift off all the lightweight material, basically the flexibles uh, that they uh, sift off. The rigid packaging will roll down and continue to number seven, where there's a magnet taking out all the steel packaging, so the ferrometals. And then we go to the first NIR, near infrared scanner uh, basically looking at the material uh, with the infrared spectrum and uh, getting some reflection back from the material and with that reflection it can identify what kind of material it's looking at um, in this case it's looking for beverage cartons uh, which would be a combination of pe on the outside with carton underneath yeah so this mixed spectrum will be analyzed and that's uh, how they will actually uh, take them out. Next one is the eddy current. Eddy current is basically like number seven, uh, a magnet, but this is just an electrostatical charge uh, which makes uh, uh, aluminum, so the non ferro metals jump out. Yeah, and that's how they separate the uh, all these aluminum cans. Final check number 10 uh, is the ballistic separation. Uh, where all the uh, materials, the leftover materials still uh, run over to, uh, to ensure that separation of flexibles and rigids has been done properly in the beginning. Um, and then uh, rigids will continue to, uh, to three, in this case, uh, uh, additional NIRs, each sorting for a different material. So we have typically, we will find the NIR for PET, one for PE and one for PP. In some countries like Germany, you also look for uh, polystyrene um, and that, well, basically it differs per, uh, per country and what has been agreed there. Then we'll go into quality inspection. Uh, that's the only part where we still have manual uh, check on the material. And then the material is sent into a bale presser where these big bales were created, ready for shipment to the reprocessor. Um, already in this part, you can see here, by the way, the, the bills that, uh, that we uh, then create and, uh, um, indeed a lot of differences per sorting installation, but also per MRF. Um, and this is ma mainly also decided by the role of the, the EPR system. So the extended produce responsibility system in the country typically pays for this, especially when it's coming from households and they uh, decide what will happen with these materials. Again, looking at the cost and the result. So required for sorting the transport, uh, but obviously big investment in uh, equipment, uh, the facility itself, but also conveyor belts, bunkers, wiring, etc. We need people there to transfer uh, to 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 work with the materials, uh, to do the maintenance and handling, uh, and of course we need energy to uh, to run the plant and administration. Final output are these big bales with a high concentration of a specific material, so over eighty percent at least, uh, depending on the material, but it's still contaminated. So if I have a PET bottle. It should be in the bill of PET, but this PET bottle still contains a PP cap and a PE uh, um, sleeve around it. So, uh, and, and probably some, some product residue uh, in the bottle as well. So that still has to be purified later on. Already for the sorting, there are some standard issues that might occur in packaging. So here we see a couple of examples of sorting disasters. Uh, again, sorting disasters, uh, some of them have actually have changed uh, their packaging. In the meantime, these are figures from 2019. Um, so it's not here to, to blame them, but to give you better understanding of the possible issues. 
uh, we could have shown uh, uh, many other brands as well. Um, first main topic is of course the use of carbon black. So not the fact that they're black, but the fact that they actually use carbon black because this absorbs the infrared light. And as it absorbs the infrared light, it cannot give a reflection to the system. So the system cannot identify uh, the polymer. Actually, it doesn't see anything. It has no idea that something is passing by. Um, meaning that a lot of these carbon black packagings actually went to, uh, to the residue uh, and would not be recycled. Now we've seen that a lot of them have already changed to identifiable black. Um, here we have all kinds of sauces, ketchup, mayonnaise, um, and this typically leaves a lot of residue in uh, product residue in the bottle. Now, after the infrared identification, let's assume that went well, we try to shoot them out by air jets and then shoot them over a certain threshold. You can imagine that if there's a lot of residue in a bottle, um, they will actually not pass this threshold and will fall down too early, uh, which makes it impossible to sort them. So we, we have some uh, specific bottles where at least 50% will not be sorted correctly because there's too much product residue in there. Again, there are solutions for that to ensure uh, uh, the material uh, uh, evacuation to, to be more fluent, but uh, this is an issue. And a very specific one is with honey uh, in PET packaging where actually honey uh, tends to start crystallizing um, after a, a certain time and people then throw it away uh, when there's still half of the packaging is still filled. We cannot shoot it out because it's too heavy. Also some flexible packaging here. Uh, these are very specific with a thick uh, aluminum layer. And uh, this is not going with the uh, uh, not not being sorted as uh, aluminium uh, because the behavior is completely different than that of a can. And it, it it's like an apple and, and, a, and a leaf falling from a tree. The apple will fall down straight and the leaf will like be floating in the air. So when this tries to jump out, it doesn't pass the threshold either. Uh, some others that uh, that might be interesting, uh, the full body sleeved, and these are actually can be compared with these as well. Um, full body sleeve, sometimes we also see that there's still a lot of product residue in there and having a full body sleeve as well. But sometimes the full body sleeve can actually uh, provide mixed images to the infrared sorter where it basically sees the material from the outside. It also gets the uh, information from the underneath uh, the, the layer underneath, um, which then is a mixed spectrum and he cannot say what it is. So he doesn't sort it. Uh, and sometimes again, depending on the country, uh, we cannot sort it because we actually are not uh, targeting a certain material. So these are polystyrene packaging in the Netherlands and they're actually not being uh, sorted in the Netherlands. So they will always end up in the residue. Just some ideas of what could happen just in the sorting. Luckily, we're also working on new sorting technologies or the industry is working on new sorting technologies. And then you can think about robotization. Here you see an image uh, the, on the left. Uh, this is basically a, a big robot where the conveyor belt normally uh, moves under. And you see these big arms in this robot picking out uh, different types of, uh, of packaging uh, based on image recognition and deep learning. So we can train the system what a certain packaging looks like, even in, in uh, uh, the situation that it's wasted, because it definitely looks different than when you buy it in the supermarket, of course. Um, but it absolutely is possible to do this. How fast will we develop this to be implemented uh, on an industrial scale? I'm not sure, but I, I have good beliefs that this in two to three years will be implemented more and more. Yeah, alternatively or additionally, not sure yet, uh, we could work with digital watermarks. You might have heard of the, uh, the uh, Holy Grail project, um, but digital watermarks are basically uh, dots in a certain uh, uh, format, which uh, can be integrated in a normal design 
of a packaging. And so it looks like this, you can hardly uh, uh, see them, but they actually perform as if there are barcodes all over the pack. Um, giving a lot of room for, uh, uh, for marketing uh, actions, adding information about the product, recipes, uh, um, allergies, uh, etc., uh, but also gaming and, and prizes that you can win as a, as a consumer. But definitely it could also be used for the sorting where actually this barcode, if the database behind it is correct, can say how we should sort it. So these uh, developments uh, are, are taking place. And, and uh, I assume that within about three years, uh, this will be implemented in more and more sorting facilities. Now, so we can optimize the sorting with these new technologies, uh, but then we still need to go to the reprocessor. And as I said, we're delivering materials that are not completely made out of PET. So eight, more than 80% of recycling is about sorting. Yeah. So that's quite essential in that part. How much sorting needs to be done? Basically up to multiple things. Where did the material come from? So the origin, was it post-consumer, post-industrial, post-production, and even from which sorting facility did it come? That will determine uh, basically the quality of, of your uh, material, material and, and the variation of your material. Quality indeed of the input, uh, how, how much non-targeted materials are in there? Do we have different types of polymer? How easy are they to separate? Is there metal or glass in there? Does it contain a lot of food residue? Um, and what kind of colors do we get? Yeah, obviously when you get post-production scrap, it's completely different than a mix of household packaging. What quality of output do we want to deliver? So what should be the purity of the polymer? What should be the melt flow index? What should be the viscosity of the material? Uh, the strength, should it be food grade or not? Uh, what color is acceptable and is an odor still accepted or not? So all these uh, things are important. Uh, and obviously, depending on the quality that a, a sorter or a reprocessor can deliver, it will be uh, finding it through to a certain application. Yeah. So basically, the application that you're working for will define how much is done to get a certain quality. Yeah, these, the application sets the requirements for the quality. So still a lot to do on that side. Now, what can you do as a brand owner, packaging developer, packaging technologist, designer uh, to design for recycling? So design for recycling is all about understanding the issues in the value chain and being prepared for those. So not only for the sorting, uh, but definitely also for the reprocessing. Yeah, so the, the examples I gave you were mainly focusing on the sorting, but there are other issues in the reprocessing. Now, there we have design for recycling guidelines. Um, so they, they support both sorting and the reprocessing. Uh, you can download them at our, at our website, suez.com slash n slash circpack. Um, for plastics, you can also find them uh, at reciclas.eu. We have integrated the Reciclas guidelines in these CERCPAC guidelines, but uh, our guidelines also contain information about glass, alu, steel, and paper and cardboard. Um, I might even see with Paul if we're allowed to uh, to share this uh, the, this desk with you uh, later on. Get back to me on that one, Paul. Um, this is a slide which is completely unreadable for you, but it is just an indication of how detailed this is. And as a packaging technologist, you should have a good understanding of this. Uh, at least you see two, three columns in three co colors, what is compatible with recycling, which is limited, has limited compatibility and which is not compatible or even is a disqualifier. These are the main topics, these 14 items. Yeah, in this case, it's just HDPE, but of course, each material has its own uh, uh, acceptance and, and uh, disqualifiers. Which colors can you use, which sizes, uh, uh, what additives are allowed in, um, if you use a label, what is allowed, uh, adhesives, also very important, when should they come off and, and let go of the label, um, 
and can I use inks? What kind of inks? And can I use direct printing, etc.? So all these items are in there, and I really, really kindly suggest you to uh, to have a closer look at this because it's really helpful. Again, this is not Suez uh, specific. This is really for any industrialized uh, country where they do automated uh, sorting and reprocessing. Um, they probably have the same standards and the same technologies in place. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's really, uh, really helpful. Finally, you can also get your products certified uh, with Reciclas. Reciclas is a value chain initiative, um, <clears throat> basically pan-European. And um, they're the, uh, the, the brand owners, uh, packaging companies, and the recyclers have, have joined forces to, uh, to set up these, uh, not only the guidelines, but an entire uh, um, certification methodology. Three types of certification are available. If you have a final product, you can go for the design for recycling certificate, uh, which basically looks, okay, can, can this product be recycled in, in Europe somewhere? If you have a recyclability rate certificate, it's basically the same. And in addition, it's country specific. So we will also look at the local infrastructure. And if you have a semi-finished packaging, so this is mainly for the brand owners, but if you're a, a packaging company, you often uh, don't have the final print or the final product in it, but you can still go for a letter of compatibility. Uh, so then at least you can say, well, what we have designed so far is completely in line with recycling. The brand owner can still screw it up by putting the wrong material in there or putting the wrong print on there. But in general, uh, we can say that, it's, uh, that it can be recycled. Yeah, so these are some of the options that you have for um, uh, for the certification. Always good to remember that there are huge differences throughout the world. So it's essential that you understand your local market. So understanding your local market uh, uh, starts, of course, with uh, uh, what kind of extended producer responsibility system is there. Um, is that a national thing or a, a, a state thing? Um, but also what fees are they charging for which types of material? Because you can really uh, save a lot of money by, by designing in such a way that it actually fits all these different fees. Um, how is this calculated? Who should pay? Is there a recyclability bonus? Um, are there any other taxes or legislation specifically for this kind of uh, uh, packaging? And of course, what are the recycling results and what is actually allowed in the collection system or systems in this country and what is actually being sorted and reprocessed. Yeah, you can always find this kind of information by looking at the, uh, the, the website of the local EPR system. Um, it's quite time consuming and things are changing uh, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, we have gathered all this and, and you can see in the booklet that you see on the right uh, for 68 countries now, uh, this is completely updated and, and uh, it's paid content, but uh, yeah, it might save you some uh, valuable time there. How did I do time-wise, Paul? Um, I'm yeah, sorry, just, um, I just always struggled with that. Here we go. So yes, that was good. Just a little bit over. So we'll crack on with my innovations and then uh, we'll, we'll get on to questions. So thank you very much um, for, for that. It's one of those presentations that you could, um, you could probably do two hours and still not cover enough detail. <laughs> Right, so let's crack on. So um, the next innovation uh, is um, from a plant-based uh, food startup um, called Mogulo, and they've collaborated with uh, Innovations and Members Graphic Package International to create a, a new feature-rich pack for their plant-based alternative to butter. Uh, the packaging has many features, including a hinge lid, um, friction closure, and pull-down front section for easy access to the content. So this very much ticks the box for um, um, making life, uh, sorry, the um, uh, uh, 
yeah, making life easy for trends. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, so the, the, the strong innovation generates no compromise to sustainability, though. A grease resistant board is free from standard plastic layers, and it means that the packaging is widely recyclable within the plastic stream, uh, according to OPRL uh, guidelines. Um, this is uh, from Sharpac, uh, collaborating with Berry Gardens with the launch of SP Airlight. Um, this is a new range of strawberry packs with a design that um, simultaneously mitigates the need for bubble pads, pads whilst also reducing a plastic content by 20% or, or while protecting the strawberries to reduce food waste. Uh, the packaging therefore is easier to recycle as the consumer um, doesn't need to remove uh, the bubble wrap. So available in a number of different sizes. Um, and there you have it. So um, this, this week, you, uh, this got quite a lot of attention in the last week or two from Amcor. Uh, blister packaging um, has been a significant and well-established format for the safe packaging of pharmaceutical products for many years. And the format has traditionally been uh, difficult to recycle. Um, Amcor have developed a new solution to, to combat this. AmSky is a, is a recent initiative that has the potential to make healthcare packaging much more sustainable. AmSky removes uh, the PVC from blister packaging, allowing it to be recycled more easily. And the innovation reports uh, to deliver the, the first child resistant and senior friendly recycled packaging for one of the most commonly used packaging types in the pharmaceutical world. Um, Unilever uh, with the Hellman's brand um, have made the transition to 100% post-consumer recycled PET for their range of squeezable mayonnaise products. We've seen an awful lot of um, switching to recycled content often 100% uh, PCR. Um, so Unilever state that the packaging change will save uh, one and a half thousand uh, tons of plastic every year, while the full range of products is uh, to make the change. The full switch to recycle PET is expected by the end of next year, um, with 40% of the range already being made from recycled material. Uh, Gla um, GSK, Glaxo, Glaxo Smith Klein, um, of, of moving a number of its toothpaste brands from aluminium barrier laminated tubes to a 100% recyclable tube and cap that could be recycled in the HTPE uh, bottle recycling stream. The tube uh, supplied by Albia Tubes is a patented plastic laminated tube called Greenleaf um, and has successfully passed tests to uh, assess recyclability. Um, by the US-based Association of Plastic Recyclers. This green leaf solution has actually been rolled out um, or is being rolled out by a number of uh, leading toothpaste um, and oral care uh, brand um, owners. So that's a, another good example of that. And last but not least, we've got um, a US-based Mexican style chicken restaurant chain called El Polo Loco, um, and they're eliminating uh, EPS um, packaging for its containers. And the replacement called Thermo to Go is made from partially recycled materials and is said to be sturdier and more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, the, remo the move will remove um, uh, 54,000 square meters of EPS every year from the waste stream. Um, and, um, and, and the company also is pioneering tamper free sealable uh, delivery bags with GPS tracking at, uh, for the start of the pandemic. So there are all the innovations. So over to Barry, uh, your online Barry, for some questions and answers, please. Are you there, Barry? Yep. Hi. Sorry, just trying to get the yeah, unmute off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right. Yes. Some questions. Um, firstly, um, Vincent, I was one of the questions I wanted to ask is. With all of the different approaches from different countries to, to recycling and um, curbside collection, et cetera, do you feel it's going to be advantage in sorting and that side of the technology that will lead to more recycling? Or do you think it's going to have to come down to the, the packaging manufacturers and packaging users to uh, help solve these problems as well? I, I think everybody is needed to, to change these things uh what we've seen so far as i i, I told you there there's no uh intrinsical economical value in these materials uh one of the biggest things that needs to be done is that legislation is in place without legislation uh the demand for recycling will be will be 
uh, non-existent. Um, so having good legislation and extended producer responsibility systems will actually um, make sure that, that the targets that are set by governments will be achieved. Um, and uh, after that, then it becomes important to design for recycling, and of course, get good collection and, and uh, ex explaining to the public what's, uh, what's going on. I don't think we should ask too much from the consumers asking them to separate components or re remove sleeves and stuff like that. Um, yes, of course, a small percentage of consumers will do that. Uh, but in general, I don't think that uh, that's the way to go. It should be straightforward. It should be simple to explain and let the technology behind it uh, take care of the rest. In your experience, who, which sort of countries or processes would you hold up as being the sort of the gold standard at the moment, or do you feel nobody is is really achieving a good standard? Um, I, I think that uh, looking at the materials and 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 the percentage of of uh, materials collected, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium are are actually doing pretty fine. Uh, UK, of course, still lacking with the flexibles mainly. Uh, there you now see that the uh, retailers actually step in there uh, because the municipalities uh, are, are not providing that service yet, uh, at least not everywhere. I think only 17% of municipalities in the UK allows for collection of, uh, of flexibles. Um, so you get these in-store drop-offs. Typically, this only leads to a small collection percentage. So curbside collection is quite essential to get things going. From a technology perspective, I think uh, uh, most of the countries use the same technologies. So there are no differences there. It's mainly what is accepted uh, and what is the install base um, or the infrastructure uh, for, uh, for recycling in the country. Do you feel with some of the certification of recyclability that there is a risk that um, food waste and, and other waste and, and product protection will be compromised for designing for recyclability or do you feel that the, the technology exists to still design for recyclability and fulfill the primary purpose of the packaging? I mean the product should always prevail. I mean protecting and preserving and promoting uh, uh, the, the, the product, it should still be the core essence of, of packaging. Um, so that for me is, is a given. Um, however, I do see some, some products which have a shelf life of 18 months where I think that 99.9% .9 of the product is actually already distributed, uh, bought and consumed uh, uh, within three months. So do we always need to have this very uh, uh, over-dimensioned packaging? No, not always. So it's always looking at what kind of product do I have? Uh, how can I ensure that the product remains uh, well for a long time? Uh, that should always prevail and will probably also be uh, there for your competitors. So uh, if within product categories, you will have a, a, a level playing field. So uh, I don't see this as a, as a risk. And I have not seen it occur that, that uh, uh, companies would jeopardize uh, other properties of their, of their packaging just to, to become recyclable. Yeah, I had a discussion with a company the other day where um, their competitors have two years shelf life on their product, but they yeah. were looking at a monthly subscription process. And I was saying, well, you don't need to achieve anything like the shelf life of your competitors because the whole business uh, proposition you're putting forward is to supply people fresh product every month so yeah. we can actually do a lot more with the packaging um, by looking you know to realize what is the actual consumption rate and how consumers use it and I think you're right that sometimes we just like to go and put nine months shelf life on because that's what we've always done and that's what our competitors exactly. do yeah. um, and if you look at the statistics probably they're being consumed within three months and maybe we could reduce those so Yes, I think uh, it's a good point. Um, are you also investing in any um, industrial composting? Because obviously we, we still see the rise of compostable materials. There is no real, particularly in the UK, routes for people to, to send these to composting. And there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about compostable materials. Um, do you see much investment in that area? 
I don't see a strong growth. Uh, no, uh, of course we assume as we the Suez Group has uh, has multiple industrial composting installations. Um, for packaging materials, so far uh, we see that decomposting industry is not really happy uh, in receiving these materials in their installations. Um, we see that these bioplastic or biodegradable plastics, sorry, uh, they cause some some unclarity for consumers because it looks and feels like plastic, but somehow this one can go into the green bin or kitchen waste bin and the other one uh, uh, should not be put in there. So you get mix up, uh, mixed up uh, uh, packaging. Um, and once it actually enters the industrial composter, we still see that the not all the uh, 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 biodegradable plastics actually biodegrade within the set time. So although there is an, an ISO norm or an NEN norm for uh, uh, industrial composting, uh, the standard time set in that uh, ISO norm is 10 to 12 weeks, where the actual average uh, uh, time span that, that you have for industrial composting is between the six to eight weeks. So there is a uh, discrepancy between the actual methodology and operational uh, situation. So it's not ideal. There are certain products that I would definitely uh, uh, support to, to have biodegradable material on there. Uh, things like tea bags, uh, which are still uh, containing a lot of uh, uh, normal plastics. Um, please put them in biodegradable plastics because uh, people will put them in the, in the compost bin anyway. Um, and that way you can at least ensure that, uh, that no uh, normal plastic uh, pollution will, uh, will occur. And at least you have the, uh, the biodegradable uh, stuff in there. I know it's one of these questions you've actually answered uh, online, but it's probably worth reiterating for the other participants that um, with your country overview report, um, will you be updating that um, sort of in a live process as things change from country to country? Yeah, so we typically uh, we do a, a, an annual update uh, because typically all the EPR fees uh, in all these countries will, will change once a year. Um, so that's the uh, the update that we typically do uh, and have finished by the end of Q1 uh, every year. And then uh, uh, intermediate changes we will uh, communicate upon by email to the, to the people who have uh, bought uh, the, the report. Okay. Yeah, and, and when you buy the annual update, you get a 25% discount on the uh, on the updated version. Excellent. Okay. I think, Paul, we're about on time now in terms of uh, our limit. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very interesting Q&A section. As I said, we could probably go on for hours with all the things that, to do with recycling. So um, thank you all very much for your attention and your attendance. We appreciate uh, your support of our events. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow for everyone that's registered and will also be on our YouTube channel. Um, we will also uh, forward uh, Vincent's uh, contact details and also check share the, the deck that he mentioned uh, in his presentation. Um, our next webinar is in three weeks, uh, Reinventing the Making of a Box. So we'll be sending out information about how to book that tomorrow. So um, until next time, stay safe and thank you very much. <laughs>